It's good to be back with you. This is where you say, it's good to have you back, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Man, you guys, so I was uh, on the other side of the pond uh, about a week ago, and uh, you had a storm without me. And we had really, really nice weather over in London, like really nice weather. Great. (laughs) Great. Yeah. Anyways, uh, it was just so cool. I think I was telling some of you, I got a text at dinner, and my wife was like, did you hear what happened at Lakeside? I'm like, no, what happened? She's like, you know, trees went down, power went out, roofs leaking. They moved the whole church downtown and live streamed. I'm like, Wow. Great team we got up there. So anyways, just bravo to the amazing team and the ways they've pivoted, uh, the community that surrounded them. And then even some of you who've reached out this week who've just said, hey, we know there were costs associated with that and we just uh, wanna give towards that. And so it's just amazing to see our church community come together and it blows me away every time. So, so good to be back with you. Uh, lots I wanna share about my trip and I will in the coming weeks and months and in the newsletters. I got so much I wanna share with you, but today we're just jumping right in. And here's why. When I was summarizing to my wife yesterday what we're talking about today, she's like, wow, you're covering everything and the kitchen sink. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going for all of it. And uh, I just, just quick reminder here, uh, we do have a kids program. I don't say this often, but sometimes I'm just like, like today, it's kind of like if this was a Netflix special, your kids would probably have to put a password to get this content, okay? So just, you've been warned, okay? Some of you are like, I'm 35, can I stay? You can stay. <laughs> all right, here we go, you ready? Um, let me ask you a question. You ever been in the turning lane and you're one car back from the front and they get the advance and the person doesn't move for like a second and a half? You ever had that? Anybody? Yeah, okay. And what do you do after about a second? Yeah, anger. Thanks for the honesty, right? Anger, honk, come on, right? You ever been in the front? You ever had the same thing happen to you where it's like, you know, you're there and you're checking the radio, changing the thermostat or texting on the seat, you know, and it's like your eyes are technically ahead, but you're kind of like, you ever had that? And all of a sudden light turns green and you miss it for a second and someone honks at you and it's like, come on, seriously? It's just a second. Where's your grace? You ever had that? Yeah, we're a bunch of hypocrites, aren't we? Here's how I summarize it. I want grace for me, but not for thee. Grace for me, but not for thee. We see this all over the place. We're at work. Someone doesn't reply to an email after 20 minutes. And we're like, what is wrong with these people? These millennials, they're the worst, right? You ever had that? Just like, why don't, why don't people reply anymore? And then someone else, you know, calls you. They're like, hey, I emailed you two days ago. It's like, email? Who uses email anymore? Or seriously? Like, I'll get to it. I'm busy, right? Grace for me, but not for thee. We see this not just at work. We see this at home with our kids. You, know, you don't have to get old and mature into this. This starts at a young age. Mom, so-and-so broke this. It's just like, mind your own business. And the next day they break something and the other child comes and tells you. And it's like, why are you tattling? It's like, yeah, we didn't need to mature into this. We all seem to have it built in. We see it in ourselves. Stop yelling. We're not yellers in this home. That may have come out of my mouth this week. Just saying. We see this in our politics. Okay, I won't go there today, but... It's true, isn't it? Totally true. We're full as humans of internal contradictions. We want to point out other people's flaws and we often miss our own. Best way to summarize it is I want truth for you, but grace for me. Truth for you, law for you. I want the rules to come down on you, but I want grace for myself. Today, Jesus encounters a religious leader who falls for the same trap who embodies this contradiction, a contradiction that if we're honest, resides in every single one of us. And I am all over Jesus's response to this situation. So we're gonna jump right into it. Luke chapter 13, if you have a Bible with you or a device that you can track along, I'd love for you to do that. If you don't, don't worry, it'll be up on the screen. But Luke chapter 13, verse 10, as you're turning there, if you're here today, you're not a church person, not a Christian, maybe you're new to Bible reading, this is like the perfect week for you to be here, right? Maybe you've felt at certain times like religious people are hypocrites. Um, This is the perfect, perfect week for you. If you're a Jesus follower, um, as always, Jesus is gonna call us out and challenge us and take us to task as well. So I hope you got your notepads with you and we're going to jump right into it. You ready? Yes. Yes. All right. I need some interaction today. Okay. You guys going to journey with me or we just, yes. All right. All right. Here we go. Okay. Maybe I scared you with the parental warning. We're going to be okay. All right. You're going to survive this. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. Okay. A little bit of context if you're new to Bible reading. What is the Sabbath? So Sabbath was one in seven days for the Jewish people. They would pause and not work. Whatever they did for six days, they'd stop on the seventh. Sabbath comes from the word Shabbat, which literally means to stop. Where did it come from? When 
the Israelites, if we go back in history, were freed from slavery, from the Egyptians, okay, from their Egyptian slave owners. Uh, they, were, they were free, and then what does God give them right after their freedom? He gives them, you've probably heard about this, but you didn't know the history or genesis of it. He gives them the 10 commandments. So the 10 commandments are given in the context of people who for the first time in their lives, literally 400 years, generation after generation, have never had freedom. They do what their slave masters tell them to do. And now all of a sudden, there's no slave masters. They can do whatever they want. And the first thing they get is a bunch of rules. Or is it? No, it's really actually God saying, here's how you live free. I know you can do anything. Don't just murder people, okay? Bad idea. I know you're free, but don't just sleep with other people's wives. Bad idea. I know you're free, but don't be lying and cheating and worshiping other gods, right? Like He's like, I know you're free, but freedom has limitations. Because if you just live free, you're then gonna start violating other people's freedom. So God gives people the 10 commandments as a document to say, this is how you actually live free in the way that you were created. And one of the commands, in fact, the longest command in there is about Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? It's a command to Sabbath. Why? Because for over 400 years, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, what do slaves have in common? They never get a day off. They never rest. So God, being the lovingly, loving Heavenly Father that He is, says, you don't have to work seven days a week. You can rest. I command you to rest. It was a gift to people who had never rested. Then religious people come along and take this amazing gift, and what do they do? They add rules around it and make it a burden. And so the religious people were like, oh yeah, this is, this is like no work. It's no works allowed. And so they started counting, like how many steps does it take to you know, go beyond leisure to work? And so then they would you know, kind of put barriers up and we don't walk further than this on the Sabbath because that would be work. And you know, if someone's hurt, can we help them? Well, healthcare is kind of work. So, I mean, if their life is in danger, you know, they've you know, ruptured something, you, know, you can give them first aid. But if they just sprain their ankle, you know, leave them till tomorrow, right? Like it, just start, like it just starts getting ridiculous. You can find this in history. They had rules upon rules. It was like they put guardrails before the guardrails to make sure they didn't break any Sabbath rules. And they took what was meant to be a gift and they turned it into what I call a no day. It's like, can we do this? Nope. That? Nope. How about this? Nope. What can I do on the Sabbath? And they tell you, and it's like, no, right? All around, it was a no day. So you just imagine like Jesus walks into this environment and now you understand what's happening. So on a Sabbath day, verse 10, Jesus was teaching in the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Some of you are like, Mark, isn't crippled politically incorrect? Absolutely. Remember, this is an old document, okay? So just chill. Don't miss the point of the, the point is she's in huge pain, bent over and cannot straighten up at all. You ever had this? I have, not for 18 years. I suffered this way for 18 months, literally, not 18 months, six months on the floor, excruciating pain, you get to that point. Some of you have been there. Some of you are there where you actually wonder, do I want to continue to live? It's a horrible existence. And I had Percocets. Like, you, can you just imagine 18 years of this? No modern health care. And so Jesus, when he saw her, Jesus sees a suffering woman. He calls her forward and he says to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praise God. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there for that? Like, can you imagine? I mean, wouldn't it be cool if like in the middle of my sermon, I was just like, hang on a second. You look like you're struggling. How long has it been? 18 years. Come on up here. Let's just pray real quick. Two minutes. Pray. Healed. How many of you would be excited by that? Two people? <laughs> Man, that's depressing. Right? Like you'd be so excited. Another question. How many of you would be frustrated? Two more minutes of this sermon? It's supposed to be 35. Now it's going to be 37. Seriously, Mark? How many of you would write a complaint email? Like, come on, stop interrupting your sermons. <laughs> None. Thank you, front row. Front row's quick. There you go. Of course, this is where the twist comes. You see, you have that reaction because you're just good, decent human beings. The synagogue leader, not happy. Clearly, there's a power struggle that is developing and his job is to run things in the synagogue and yet... Where's everybody's attention right now? It's not on him, it's on Jesus because Jesus just freed someone from 18 years of bondage. Look what the religious leader says. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Your accusation is healing 
is work. You want to talk about who's getting worked up? How about the religious leader who's insecure and now there's like veins popping out of his neck and he's breaking out in a sweat and he's upset at the religious guy who just freed someone from 18 years of suffering. You want to talk about getting worked up? It's you, bro. It's you. Jesus is having none of it. The Lord answered him. You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox and donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? You see, remember the religious leaders had built all these rules around Sabbath and what you could and couldn't do. And of course they had an exemption, like our animals need to drink water and eat. So it's not work if we take them out. I mean, their lives are on the line. I mean, can you imagine if an animal didn't eat for a day, right? So they have their livestock and they have their rules that give them an exception to feed their animals on the Sabbath. And Jesus is not here for it. He's calling it out. He says this in verse 16, then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, a fellow human being, one of your own people, this is literally what Jesus is saying with that phrase, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Jesus is saying, you can untie your donkey, but I can't untie this woman from the bondage she's suffered all these years. Your animals can't go a day without food, but she has to suffer another day in excruciating pain because some religious man decided that's the way it should be. Is she allowed in the conversation? Is anyone gonna ask her opinion? Some ways not much has changed. But Jesus is not like the religious leader. Let's go back to verse 12 for a second. I just love this part. When Jesus saw her, Jesus sees her, he sees her suffering, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you're set free. He sees her, that's a whole other sermon hiding right there in plain sight. He calls her forward, he centers her in her pain. And he knows what's coming. He knows the religious institution is gonna have a conniption. It's gonna explode. And he's not gonna let her get blamed for seeking freedom. He doesn't wait for her to ask for healing. He initiates. He stands in the gap. If anyone's gonna have a temper tantrum, it's gonna be towards Jesus and not this suffering woman. Okay, let's pause here for a second. Where are we at? We have a religious expert who's an expert in missing the point at this point. The Ten Commands were meant to bring freedom and instead he's using them to care for an animal and abuse a woman. And yes, withholding health care from someone is abuse. Here's how I summarize the problem of the religious leaders. They had grace for themselves and their animals and truth, truth for the vulnerable suffering woman. And I love how it ends. It's a theme we see often in the gospels. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. The religious elite upset and the commoners excited. That's the kind of impact Jesus has on the people around him. And we wanna be Jesus followers. Here's the bottom line. Sometimes the religious institution gets it wrong. They get lost in their rules and forget the rules were given as tracks to help love God and love others. Jesus says so. You can summarize all the commands as loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And often we end up accomplishing the opposite. Now, it's easy from our vantage point to say, stupid religious people doing stupid religious things. But the reality is all of us are prone to fall for the same trap. We are all tempted to want truth for you, but grace for me. The authors in scripture refer to this in all kinds of ways, but one of them is this kind of this gravitational pull. It's a word they use called sin. All of us suffer from it. And the reason, the reason why, even though our intention is often to love God and love others, our gravitational pull, our sin nature, ends up doing the opposite, as we see in this story. Now, I've studied a lot of church history, and there are times when the church nails the Jesus way. In fact, so many. They often don't make the headlines, but I just love it when the church stands in the gap for vulnerable people and knock it out of the park. But there are other times like this religious leader where they do the opposite, where they leverage their power for their own preferences and give into the gravitational pull of their hearts to the sin. And instead of partnering with Jesus and freeing people, we in the name of God and even scripture bind people up. Let me give you one example of how we've done this in the past. Divorce. There are times and places in history where church leaders refuse parishioners divorce. All kinds of reasons. And one of the often quoted lines is from the book of Malachi. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. 
And we can have a whole debate on divorce and there's lots of different perspectives even here in this room. But here's the thing I wanna point out in this scenario. There are certain times where religious leaders encourage women, not always women, sometimes men, but mostly women, encourage women to stay in abusive relationships because God hates divorce. They've said things like, well, it's just what the Bible says. And it's clear. And countless women, women suffered greatly because of it. Thankfully, thoughtful Jesus followers listening to the Spirit felt something's not right about this. This doesn't feel very Jesus-y. And they were able to approach the scriptures and ask the questions, what's happening here? And long story short, this is a sermon for another day. If you dig into the context, you discover in the ancient Near East, men could divorce their wives for literally any reason. There are historical examples of men divorcing their wives because they put too much salt in the food. And getting a divorce in the ancient Near East was to have no future for the woman, no security. It was to be abandoned, to maybe suffer poverty and danger and so much else. That's what divorce meant for women in the first century. And so God speaks into that context and says, I hate divorce. It's atrocious. And yes, he hates it because it's used in that context as a tool of abuse towards women and God isn't here for it. And yet years later, women are seeking freedom from abuse, are told by religious leaders with the same passage that was meant to free them from the abuse, you can't leave an abusive marriage. That's not God's will. God hates divorce. Some even told it's for God's will that they endure the abuse. And that still happens today sometimes. When I think about that, I just think history's crazy. How do I summarize all this? I simply say it's religious people wielding scripture, scripture or their interpretation of it, and yet partnering with evil. We see this in the story we just covered of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. We see history is full of examples like this. Your social media feeds are full of this. And honestly, I'm done with it. Now, let me be clear, because sometimes people come to me and say, Mark, it, it seems like you're attacking scripture. No, 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 I love scripture. I just want the next generation, I want them to know just because someone has a verse, it doesn't mean what they're doing is biblical or Christ-like. I've just sat with far too many individuals who've been abused and suffered at the hands of religious people who were wielding scripture and yet partnering with evil. I always remind you, every cult has a verse to justify their abuses. Every toxic leader leverages and misinterpreted passages. And I want the next generation to think critically and dig for the real meaning and be less vulnerable to all kinds of spiritual abuse that's out there. And that's why I talk about it so much, that the next generation wouldn't just parrot scripture, but personally wrestle with it. Now, the temptation, like me, you know, you probably this too, is, you know, just kind of think like, oh, history is so messed up. The church is so messed up. Faith is so messed up, you know, and we just maybe just want to run from it. And we don't even realize how foolish it can be to not see our own hypocrisy and that that gravitational pull that is alive and well in so much of those stories we just talked about actually resides in our hearts as well. Can I give you a modern example? I have some fun here. Yes, front row. Love it. Let's talk birth control. Whoa, hard right turn. Here we go. Did you know that for the first 1900 years of church history, virtually all Christians saw any method of birth control as an abomination? No joke, okay? It's only in the last 100 years, the 1920s and beyond, that Christians began to change their mind and their practices on birth control. In fact, Bridget Rivera in her book points out in the history, most Christians saw the use of birth control as more serious than adultery and even akin to murder. And if you tried to say otherwise, you would be considered a heretic. To which you might say, where did those crazy Christians get a wild idea like that from? Great question, the Bible. You can read this one on your lunch break. It'll be really fun, but I'll just summarize it for you. Genesis 38, eight to 10 is a summary. Uh, there's a man named Onan and his brother dies and his sister-in-law Tamar has no kids. And so culturally in that time, if that happened and your sister-in-law had no kids and she was now a widow, you would have to sleep with her to give her children so there could be an heir to kind of protect the family. In that culture, if you didn't have kids, it was similar to being divorced, right? It was like, there was no future. You had no protection. You had no retirement plan. Okay, so that's how they did it in the ancient world. And so Onan is told by Judah to go and sleep with her. So he does, but he takes a little bit of an interesting turn. I'm just gonna read it straight from the Bible. This part doesn't need summarizing, okay? But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, it's just in the Bible, he spilled his semen on the ground and to keep from providing offspring for his brother. Hmm, that's an interesting tactic. 
So God has a reaction to that in the story. He takes him out, bam, he's dead. Modern Christians tell this story a little bit of a different way than Christians have for the last 1900 years. We see Onan's sinful behavior as the fact that he was selfish, but that's a new interpretation. For 1900 years, Christians focused on the shocking nature of his sexual conduct. They understood the creation mandate, we've all heard this, be fruitful and multiply, not only under as a positive commission, but an ethical restriction on the type of intercourse permitted within marriage. For 1900 years, any sex that didn't have procreative potential was seen as sin. It was seen as intentionally subverting the created order that God designed. In fact, there's lots of other examples in scripture of men also not fulfilling that same duty, except they just decided to abstain completely. And they weren't dropped dead. They were simply given a public shaming. Why? It was because the actual act of intercourse, but then thwarting the actual design, that was what was seen as the perversion. And if you think I'm kind of making this up and this is some fringe theory, just for fun, here are some Christian theologians throughout the years that you may have heard of and their views on the story of Onan. Let's start with John Calvin. You've heard of him. This is him speaking directly to this story. You can tell how old this is. Deliberately avoiding the intercourse. The intercourse. This is like when people talk about the Facebook or watch that on the YouTube, right? Deliberately avoiding the intercourse so that the seed drops on the ground is double horrible. For this means that one quenches the hope of his family and kills the son before he was born. Bring that up at the next family dinner with one of your relatives who likes John Calvin. John Wesley, same story referring to those who follow his example destroy their own souls. I'm speaking at a Wesleyan camp this summer. I kind of want to bring this quote just to see. Martin Luther, it's far more atrocious than incest and adultery. Speaking of what Onan did, we call it unchastity. Yes, a sodomitic sin. Wait, 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 Sodom. We have another thing that we associate with that. And this is what you need to understand about ancient Christians. Any sexual activity that did not have procreative potential, they referred to it this way. Augustine, married couples who resort to contraception, although called by the name of spouses, are really not such. They return, they retain no vestige of true matrimony, but pretend the honorable designation as a cloak for criminal conduct. Criminal conduct. Jerome, you want some more? Some of you go so as far as to take potions that they may ensure barrenness, thus murder human beings almost before conception. Hmm. The silence is deafening, isn't it? So what happened 100 years ago? Why did the church abandon 1,900 years of tradition because they felt they were more enlightened? Did culture influence them? Did they grow? And did, did we just grow in access to birth control? And that just overshadowed Christians' passage for the passion for the Bible and God's way and God's design? I know what you're thinking. Especially the men in the room. I know what you're thinking. Mark? Thank you for telling us this. I had no idea, but I'm so glad now I'm enlightened and I know the truth about Christian history. And I know all the men are thinking the exact same thing. How quickly can I get an appointment to reverse my vasectomy so I can stop thwarting God's ways? I don't want to participate in this heinous sin anymore. In fact, you're going to go home. You're going to tell your wives, no more sex until the vasectomy is reversed. I don't want to get in the way of God's created order. I don't want to go against 1,900 years of church history. I just don't want to risk it, babe. And honey, while we wait, we can keep ourselves busy calling all our friends and informing them of this and telling them of this grievous sin. And we can invite them to join us. And if they question us, we'll just read the story of Onan and we'll tell them how the historic church viewed this. And we'll tell them it's clear. And if they try to argue, we'll just tell them the Bible's clear and it's not even a conversation. And we just got to get back to God's created order. That's what we'll do, right? Sure. Yeah. No, you won't. Here's what most of you are going to do today. You're going to assume it changed for good reason. You're going to assume since most Christians that you know practice birth control, there must be something in these passages and in these theologians' ideas that were missed. We aren't going to spend any time researching this. We're going to spend zero time making sure we aren't violating God's will. We'll spend zero time praying just to make sure we haven't accidentally stumbled upon progressive Christian behavior. And you will put this in the little category of mostly forgettable things your pastor once said. What's the point? It's here. You and I, we aren't so different from this religious leader. The fact that we don't even know why we believe something we act on and expect everyone else to defend their decisions, that's hypocrisy. Truth for them, grace for me. See how it sneaks in? And if we don't pay attention to this gravitational pull, 
we are bound to repeat history again and again, putting ourselves first and violating vulnerable people along the way while we give ourselves a pass. Isn't that fascinating? And that's just one of many examples I could give you that would convict you and I in ways that just kind of reveal our hypocrisy. So let's, let's land this plane and let's talk about the final topic that I want to cover that's really important to us as a church today. And some of you are like, wait, 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 Mark, all the guys are asking before you continue, can you please just answer the question, is birth control okay? Like, are we good with that? I'm going to leave that ball in your court. You, just, all of a sudden you're motivated to have a Bible study tonight, okay? That's great. <laughs> Here's where I want to close. I want to talk about the LGBTQ plus community. Just take a deep breath. I'm not here to drop any bombs on you. There's no surprise. There's no bait and switch. Just want to give you a quick update on the conversations we've been having, some next steps we're looking at, and how we can kind of move forward in this. Now, some of you are new to Lakeside, and the question I get all the time from people is, where do you stand with the LGBTQ plus community? And I always tell our staff, and I always keep this in mind, I say, friends, clear is kind. We never hide where we're at. So whenever I talk with someone on this topic, I let them know exactly where we're at. I tell them, listen, since the inception of this church, we have held what many call a traditional view of marriage. One man, one woman. As a church, we hold that perspective collectively, and we would see anything else not as a view that we practice or affirm. That's reflected by the majority of churches today. Two years ago, a question was asked, a question a question we've asked on numerous topics in our church history and that Christians have asked you know, throughout the centuries. And this one was specifically relating to our views on sexuality and our approach to this community specifically. And the question was simply this, can we have a conversation about this? Can we have a conversation about this? So two years ago, the elders assigned a committee of staff and elders and congregants to explore and discuss and make some recommendations to our board as to whether we continue to hold that view or to have maybe a different approach. The purpose of the committee was simply research and recommendations. They had zero decision-making power whatsoever. Now, immediately when we decided to have that conversation as a church, there were lots of emotions, naturally. Some people were super excited that we were talking about it. Some felt very uncomfortable. Some were unsure how to feel. For some, they felt like having the conversation was doubting or abandoning scripture. I've had conversations with people in all of those categories with different perspectives on the topics I've just mentioned. I want to give you, just especially if you're new and you're wondering, like, why would you have that conversation? Or why wouldn't you have that, right? Like, just, you're just wrestling with that, and that's maybe new for you. Maybe you've come since the pandemic, and that's kind of new information for you. And so here's kind of a, you know, you just kind of peek, you know, fly on the wall, peek into one of the conversations I've had with people over and over and over again. When I chat with people who are nervous or wondering why we're having this conversation, my experience, first of all, is that it's always so genuine. You know, like, it's like, it's, it's a genuine conviction of like, Mark, the, the Bible's really clear, church history's clear, don't you know it's against God's design. Like, help me understand why we're even talking about this. So I want to let you know, here's how I respond to that question, which always leads, always leads to a fascinating conversation. I rarely, in fact, never really start with rebutting any of the things they've just claimed. I I just start with some simple statistics that immediately help them understand our heart and our posture in this matter. And I just want to share that with you today to get everyone up to speed. Here's the stats I share with people. Suicide is an incredibly real issue that we're dealing with in our day and age. 11 people, these are Canadian statistics, 11 people in our country will take their lives today. 275 people will attempt to take their life today and every single day this year. The most at-risk age group is people aged 13 to 24. And the most vulnerable in there are our grade 10 students who are 15 years old. In spring, it's the highest rates of suicide in our country. Now, here's the good news. The stats tell us that whatever background or circumstance you come from, statistically speaking, if you join a church, your risk of suicide drops immediately. That's good news. That excites me. That should be true. That should always be true. We should be a community of hope. And that statistic is true completely across the board except for one category. If you're part of the LGBTQ plus community, if you join a faith community in this country and you're part of that community, your odds and risk, the risk of suicide that you are at increases. And I'm not talking by a percentage point or two. I'm talking by 27%. That is not okay. That if you join a church, you join a Jesus community, 
and the risk of you taking your own life skyrockets by 27%, that is not okay. And that is why we're having a conversation. Can we all agree that we need to have a conversation? Even if you are certain that you will never change your mind, you're confident, and are you confident in the way and the approach and the posture of the church is the way of Jesus when joining a church community increases your risk of suicide by 27%? Is 27% an acceptable number to you? Ask Rose, our kid's pastor. She spent over 25 years working for victim services. She's literally on the front lines, has told countless family members and sat with them and told them their child has taken their life. Look at Rose in the eye and say, 27%, what do you think about that? She'll tell you what she thinks about that. It is not acceptable. This is why we are having a conversation on this topic. It is a matter of life and death. And we have some things to figure out as a church, if that is what our approach nationally is impacting. So I don't apologize for the conversation. For me, getting this conversation and approach correct is a matter of life and death. And at this point, a refusal to have a conversation for a vulnerable group is an exercise in the same hypocrisy of this religious leader truth for you, grace for me, and I want none of it. So that is part of the reason why Lakeside is having the conversation that's so important to us. And that conversation continues. And to kind of give you a glimpse into that conversation, the committee after, you know, and COVID had some bumps, so it was slow, but the committee did their work. They shared their recommendations with the board. The board has begun reviewing that. And the board actually felt it was important as a church that we actually journeyed. It kind of felt them with COVID. I think it exacerbated, it, you know, made it you know, worse, but it felt like there, you know, there's conversations happening and we're not part of it. That wasn't the desire. And I, I apologize if that's what you felt, but we really actually want to have this conversation as a community and journey together with this as a community. So I own the gap, but um, I'm I'm just opening up that conversation with you now and letting you know that in the fall, we're hoping to have some open discussions, some conversations on this issue, but we felt it was important to give you an opportunity to learn a bit about it because for many of us, this is a topic that we've never generally researched, dug into, and maybe for some of us even cared about. It's never been on our radar and we've never realized the risks involved in this conversation and how high the stakes are. And so I want to invite you not just to show up in the fall and, you know, ready to have a conversation, but actually to engage in different content, maybe content that has a different perspective that maybe you've grown up having. I know we have people on different sides of this equation, and I think there's something so loving about actually understanding other people's perspectives. So we're going to, through our newsletter, send out different resources, books, podcasts, YouTube links, and all that. But I thought I'd start with just three simple book recommendations. And depending on where you naturally land, I encourage you to read the opposite. So the first one is this. Um, It's from the traditional view, uh, which is People to be Loved by Preston Sprinkle. The reason why I love this book is uh, the author who wrote it, Preston, he actually said, I am not going to spend an hour writing this book before I've spent an hour with this community. And so for every hour that was spent writing, he was spending an hour with the LGBTQ plus community. And you can just tell as you read in the pages of this book how much he loves this community. And he holds a traditional view and, and argues for that. The second book is um, by David Gushy, and it comes from the other perspective. It's the non-traditional, or what would be called the affirming view. It's called Changing Our Mind. He's a Christian ethicist who literally wrote a textbook on Christian ethics, including a non-affirming view. And in this book, he details what led him to change his mind on this topic, okay? So that's from the other perspective. And the third book, which I think is actually really helpful, and I recommend it to lots of people. I listened to it on Audible. It was an easy, accessible, lots of stories, but lots of facts as well. Bridget Eileen Rivera, she comes right down the middle. It's called Heavy Burdens, Seven Ways LGBTQ Christians Experience Harm in the Church. And she's just basically, kind of like I exposed the suicide stats, that's one of her seven ways in which um, this community just suffers so greatly in the church, things that we're not aware of. She's not taking a side. She's saying this conversation is so important because lives are on the line. And she calls out a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of double standards. And it's really sobering to read. And so I highly recommend that as well. So lots more resources. I felt that was a good start. And I just want to invite you to journey with us and be part of that conversation. Uh, Let me take a minute just to talk to those of you in this church who would find yourselves as part of the queer community. Whether you're out in the open or you're in hiding, let me just say a few things to you. That you would trust us with your presence. I'm blown away by. That you would attend one of our sites or even log in to watch our live stream is amazing to me. I've met some of you. You've shared some of your journey, your story, your pain. 
your fears, your struggle. And I just feel so honored that you would trust us with your presence and with your journey because historically, churches have not been a safe place to even share your story, to ask questions, to wrestle. I just want you to know on behalf of our pastoral team, our pastors hold these stories close and you can reach out anytime. We are so happy to chat with you and I look forward to meeting more of you. I just want you to know you're not alone. Secondly, if you're struggling with suicidal ideation, whether you're part of the queer community or this is just where you're at today, um, I just wanna give you a few resources that are just for immediate help. Number one, there's here 24 seven. Actually, I have some of their business cards. The business cards are also always at guest services. Um, and this is a crisis hotline. However you define crisis, if you feel you're in crisis, you can call here 24 seven and they're here 24 seven. It's in the name um, and they will get you the right um, resources. You can also, if you forget that, you can call 211. They'll always connect you to here 24 seven and other um, parts of the community that will journey with you. Um, you can just say, hey, I'm struggling with thoughts or ideation or whatever, whatever it is they will get you connected. Those are immediate 24 seven. You can't reach anyone else. You can reach out there. Someone will be there. Our prayer teams are always here. You can always reach out to them. They're trained and they have the same information. If you forget, you can just go to a prayer team member. They'll happily pray with you, but they'll also give you this information. So we're just so, uh, want you to have those resources. Okay, I'm getting close to the in the plane. How are we doing? Everyone still with me? Okay. A light day, religious hypocrisy, double standards, divorce, abuse, birth control, and the LGBTQ plus conversation. Did we miss anything? Whew. All right. Here's my experience. This is usually very emotionally charged conversation, and we rarely have space to be still. It's just such a reactive conversation. It's Pentecost Sunday. Can we check in with the Holy Spirit? Can we just be still for a moment? And can we just let God reveal what's in our hearts? The psalmist cries out to God, you know, show me what's in my heart. And so maybe some of you are feeling something. You're feeling excited, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling something really positive or something very uncomfortable. You're whatever it is, and you're not even sure where you're feeling or what you're feeling. You can actually just pray this, this prayer. Come Holy Spirit and just allow the Spirit of God to reveal to you what's going on. So can we just, can we just be still for a minute? And let's just, let's just invite the Holy Spirit to help us realize what's happening in us. Because I realize there's a lot with this conversation. So Holy Spirit, we just give you a moment to speak to our hearts. Friends, as you're leaving today, can I just bless you with conversations? That we be people who aren't grace for me, truth for you. That we'd be willing to engage in hard conversations and they are hard conversations. And I realize for some of you, you're a little nervous. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm open to this conversation, but I have a roommate or I have a friend or I have a parent and if they found out we were talking about this, like they'd have a lecture for me at the next Thanksgiving. I realize that. Um, here's the thing that I... I say, and maybe it's a tip for what you can say in those moments, you know, when people seem shocked that we're having the conversation, it kind of disarms things a little bit. Just say, when it comes to the queer community, we're pro-life, okay? That'll throw them for a little bit of a loop, and then you can, you know, on-ramp into this conversation a little bit. Just like, you realize there are lives on the lines with this conversation. This is not some theological football, but we need to have this conversation because lives hang in the balance, and we worship a God who said, I came to bring life and to bring it to the full. And if that's not happening, it's not because of Jesus, we're somehow getting in the way and we need to figure that out. And it starts with conversation. You with me on that? Yes. All right, friends, so let's go. <laughs> Thanks for hanging with me. It was a heavy day, but I love you guys. I just, I just think you're an amazing community and I just bless you with amazing conversations. Prayer team's up at the front and I'd love to see you at guest services. Say hi, put a name to a face. Bye for now, friends.